Hello, welcome along. Happy New Year. It's a brand new episode of the Fun Kids Science Weekly. My name's Dan. Thanks for joining us. Are you ready to spend the start of 2021 traveling through the universe trying to uncover some of the deepest science mysteries? This week on the best podcast of the year, uh, we'll talk about one of the most brutal big cats on the planet. You can hear about a big NASA space test as well. That's gone pretty well. Uh, And we'll finally answer one of the most obvious science questions that I cannot believe we've not talked about yet. It's happening in just a sec. Before then, let's get a lesson from one of the smartest schools outside of the solar system and check in at Deep Space High. Deep Space High. Space for all. Welcome to your wormhole and travel to Deep Space High. The school in space. But hurry, because lessons are about to begin. Just imagine us lot in the future. I wonder where we'll all be and what we'll be doing. Writing about missions, planning the trajectories of launches, studying the landscapes of new planets, recording the music of Mars. Quark, I bet you end up being a sports scientist running training sessions for astronauts. I just wish I knew what I wanted to do. I love it here at Deep Space High, but I don't really have a favourite lesson. Not all jobs are things you learn at school. Some are fields of study that you might only find out about when you're older. Come on, let's go on a whistle-stop tour of some of them. Computer sim, let's show them. Um, we're in a courtroom. That's right, my lord. <clears throat> uh, you could be a space lawyer, interpreting laws to help everyone agree how we should behave in space. Or helping to protect planets from human contamination. Or maybe deciding what the rules are when rescuing stranded astronauts. Hey up, that looks expensive. The test rocket crashed. Uh, crashing rockets isn't a job I'd want. Launching rockets into space is risky and expensive. People called space insurers look at what the risks are and provide financial cover in case anything goes wrong. It can be quite exciting. You might have to visit the factory where the space vehicle is being built and also attend its launch. Right, what's next? Okay, zip your coats up, it's gonna get chilly. Forecasting the weather is of vital importance to spacecraft launches. If it's too stormy or the clouds are too thick, the rocket could be at risk. You could work as a meteorologist, Sam, using data from satellite radar and weather stations to make forecasts. As long as I could do it indoors. That doesn't surprise me. Okay, anyone hungry? Whoa! These are the packets of food astronauts take into space. Can we try them? Go ahead. Not bad. Tastes like chocolate milkshake. Many, many people and jobs are behind those little packets. Nutritionists work to ensure astronauts are getting the vitamins and minerals they need. Chefs will develop recipes that taste good in space. Food scientists will come up with ways to make the packets last for a long time. And designers will make packaging light and easy to use with no crumbs. Can I have another one? No time. And if you study medicine when you're older, there's a wealth of jobs in space for you. Everything behaves differently in space, whether plant life or animal life, including the human body. Space medics study the differences to help experiments run smoothly and to keep everyone in space in good health. Computer, back to class. Predicting weather sounds cool, but I like food. It would be cool to... Ah, I just don't know. It doesn't really matter if you don't know for sure. You've plenty of time to think about it. And things change every year. There'll be jobs in space in the future that we can't even imagine right now. Not least as space tourism is developing. You could be an air steward on a space plane, sell space holidays, or run a theme park on (laughs) theatre. Now that sounds cool. Finally. And that means we've reached the final lesson. Well done, everyone. Class dismissed. Deep Space High. Space for all. With support from the UK Space Agency. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash space. It's time to answer some of your questions, my favourite part of the show. Uh, I reckon it's probably yours too. Where you send me a science question, you leave it as a review wherever you're listening on Apple Podcasts. uh, And then I do my best bit bit of science Sherlock work and I do some digging. Uh, The brilliantly named... 
Toilet Paper King 123, don't think it's their real name, but they ask, why can you get scared of spiders? Now, we're scared of things, toilet paper. (laughs) We're scared of things that we're unsure of, things that could maybe harm us. It's our mind's way of protecting our body from getting hurt most of the time. Now, scientists think that a reason for arachnophobia, which is the smart word for being scared of spiders, that they think a reason for that may be that you've had a bad experience with spiders before. That's what some scientists think. Others think that maybe it's because spiders are so strange, that they're so unlike humans, it kind of freaks us out. Uh, Because they've got eight legs. Uh, They're normally very hairy as well, aren't they? And they walk strangely. They're all over the place, really erratic. Experts think that it's how quick and unpredictable spiders are. That's what makes them so terrifying and why some of us have arachnophobia. Uh, Now, uh, another question today is from Reese, who's in California. Very jealous of you, Reese. Love to be out in California. Uh, He asks, how is lightning made? You know what, Reese? We've never answered this question before. The show has been going on a little while now. We've managed to bag one award for the best podcast in the universe. And in all that time, we've never spoken about how lightning is made. And here it is. The clouds overhead that you probably see on a thundery, stormy night, they've got little bits of ice in them. And when they move around the Earth, this ice, it bumps around, it moves, collides into each other. And those collisions... That friction makes an electrical charge build up in the cloud. Now, there are two types of electrical charge that you can get, positive and negative, And we know the opposites attract, don't they? Uh, and this is what makes the lightning. The charge in the cloud is mostly a negative electrical charge. And the charge on the ground on Earth can be positive. Now, when the charge in the cloud gets so strong that it can't stay there, it is attracted to its positive So it jumps down to Earth, and some of the Earth's positive charge leaps upwards. They almost meet in the middle. Now, lightning is hot. It's it's burning hot. And when it's released, when there's a lightning strike, it heats up all of the air that's around it, and that makes the gas in the air expand, which makes the huge boom that we call thunder. So that's how lightning and thunder's made. Interesting. You know when you sometimes get a little static shock when you touch metal? Like maybe when you walk over a, like a fuzzy carpet and then touch a door handle and you get a little buzz. And that's the same sort of thing as lightning. Uh, so there you go. Finally on the show, we figured out how lightning is made. Reese, thank you for asking that. I hope you're having fun over in California. And if you want your question answered on this show, you need to leave it as a review for the Fun Kids Science Weekly over on Apple Podcasts. We're talking weather this week on the Fun Kids Science Weekly because, and can you believe this, we've done like the show for three and a half years now and we have never had anyone on to chat about why weather does what it does. And that changes this week uh, because Judith Ralston is a BBC weather presenter and she's got a brand new book out. It's called What's the Weather? And she's on the show with us. Hey, Judith. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much for bringing your big brain to the Science Week. I'm very big excited. Big brain, I like that. I thought, uh, just be, as I said, because really we don't know much about the weather and why it does what it does. I thought we would give you some like uh, year one type questions just so you can help us understand stuff. Yeah, sure. When I watch the forecast, there are lots of these circles and Mm -hmm. there's sometimes quite a lot of them and it looks almost like the topography maps of a mountain. Sometimes they're quite spread out, sometimes they're close together. And I know this talks about pressure. Mm -hmm. Why, like what does high and low pressure mean in weather and how does that affect things? Okay, well, if you take... um high pressure is initially it, we can relate that to say dry settled conditions as a rule of thumb but if we take low pressure it typically equates to unsettled weather so that's when we see rain it's when we see winds picking up so a low pressure system will bring unsettled conditions and it's actually when air rises it cools and condenses and that's what generates the clouds that's what generates the rain and in the UK we take our weather more often than not from the Atlantic so we're whipping in these low pressure systems that come across the Atlantic sometimes from the 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 United States of America all the way across that side of the Atlantic they start to develop as they leave there or or on their way to Scotland uh, sorry to the UK and 
this is what the, it, it brings an energy which brings the rain which brings the wind as well so that's kind of what low pressure does high pressure is generally when um, pressure drops believe it or not and it's when things uh, our weather becomes settled and dry and we've just had quite a high pressure um spell of weather recently where it's been uh, cold it's been quite frosty there's been a lot of fog around fog uh, generated uh, underneath the high pressure system often these uh, these are uh, characteristics of that kind of weather if that makes any sense to you dan <laughs> it does make sense judith what i'm the only thing i'm struggling to get my head around is what is it a pressure of oh <laughs> Is it, is, it, is, it, is it general air pressure? <laughs> yes, air pressure. I had to think there. Yeah, it's just air pressure. So when it rises, it becomes uh, low pressure. It's like the pressure pushing up and everything explodes and it gets quieter as it drops. And if there's low air pressure, if, which means that there isn't a lot of that air about, yes. it means um, there's this kind of, I guess, basically, there's kind of more space for all this weather to, to all, all this confusion and this chaos to happen. Mm -hmm, exactly. That's what's and it's, it's very, as I say, our weather is often dominated by the kind of Atlantic with bringing in those low pressure systems. I'm sure you, you recognise that yourself. Yes. And how are we able, how are you able when uh, working in weather, how are you able to predict so far in advance? You know, we have four, two week forecasts now. How are you able to kind of get a handle on what's going to happen in the skies in two weeks time? Okay, well, I think it's more of a trend that you're looking at uh, over a two-week forecast. I think we can pretty safely forecast over five days, which are these are the kind of television weather forecasts or radio forecasts that you hear or see. It's uh, I think the most accurate in, in a five-day window. Over two weeks, you're seeing a kind of trend. You're seeing perhaps a trend for unsettled weather, so the trend for low-pressure systems or or a trend for you know a high-pressure system or things to be changeable. So it's definitely a two week forecast is more of a kind of feeling, if you like, or a trend, an instinct. And our weather is actually done through modeling, which is a computer generated forecast, which um, the weather boards uh, at say the Met Office or Meteor Group <clears throat> would use to forecast the weather. So it's all done through maths and science. And then the actual forecasters get in on the act closer to the time and closely forecast the weather using the models, using their experience. But one thing I use a lot of when I'm doing my day-to-day -day forecasting is the satellite picture and the radar because you can see around the British Isles, anybody can go and look at the satellite and radar. You can go to the Met Office and look, Google satellite um, radar Met Office, and you can see a picture of the United Kingdom. And what if you press radar, you'll see where the rain is, if there is any rain, or satellite, you can see where it's cloudy and where it's sunny. And that's a great tool. I use that for um, you know, early forecasting, if I'm going on radio and I can see, well, the rain's just off the west coast, it's going to sweep in over the next few hours. So that's a very useful tool. And that's a tool that a lot of uh, forecasters uh, use when they're, say, out in the field, for example, in Antarctica. If you're forecasting for planes to come in, they'll do it by the satellite and radar. Hey, so hang on, when you're doing the weather on telly, on radio, are you putting your the whole thing together? You're kind of looking at these charts and you're figuring out what you need to tell people? Yes, I think oh! the biggest skill that I have, um, well, we're, we're giving a briefing, but I've already looked at the charts by then and had a, a feeling for it. And because I work primarily in Scotland, I have a real feel for my area. So I recognise um, the difference, the land lies uh, say in the west of Scotland, we've got a lot of mountains, we've got a lot of uh, sea around the coast. So I know what will happen in a certain wind direction, say in a southwesterly wind, if it's going to be raining and windy, there'll be a lot of rain pushing into western parts of Scotland, but not so much rain in the east because the mountains act as a barrier to the rain in the east. So I know my patch, if you like, so I can recognise certain patterns that will happen um, in, in our weather. The thing we skill we have as weather presenters is being able to translate the weather speak of the scientists into something that the public would understand. Certainly when I first started weather, that's how I became quite good at my job because I had to understand it. And I've kept that simplifying kind of ethic through my work because I think 
It's, it's got to be simple. It's got to be easy to, for people to pick up whether they need an umbrella or they need a warm coat or gloves. That's the basis of our forecast really for this country, isn't it? It's what you need for the day ahead. Uh, I'm, I'd like to ask you some secrets of being a weather presenter on the telly, <laughs> if that's OK. When you're on camera, uh-huh. um, uh, is the map behind you? Yes, uh-huh. you, I can you, see it. You can <laughs> see that map. It is actually there. Yes. It's not uh-huh. put on afterwards. No, it's not. But it's quite a bit behind me, so I can't touch it. So it's a good arm's length and more behind me. But I can see my map and the camera ahead of me. Are you reading off a script like an auto cue, or no, are you just kind of all, yep, bus, busking all up it here, as you go along? All, yeah, it's exactly what I do. And I, I, I've tried several times in the, in, over my career, which is quite a, you know quite a long career now, to learn the words, but I cannot do it. So I end up. Every time before I go on air, I always get this feeling of, what am I going to say? But I know the weather story so well. So when I actually start, it comes out the way I would tell, well, my kids or, you know, my next door neighbour. Um, but that I still have that moment of panic when I don't know what I'm going to say. But I know for sure what's going on with the weather. I know it's going to rain. I know it's going to be windy. I know there's going to be gales or it's going to be dry. It's just it threads together as I start to speak when I go on air. But that's a yeah. skill I've learned over the years. It's not it's not unlearnable if you want to be a weather presenter. And the map and the graphics mm-hmm. behind you, uh, are you controlling that? Who's putting it together? How does that side of it work? Yeah, we put our, our pictures together as well. Um, we we sort of lo- we make what's called a show, so the different pictures that go into our weather forecast behind us. We put the different pictures on, um, right up to you putting your name on, and and there's a clicker. Some of my colleagues like to just press the clicker once and, and let the show run, so they have to keep talking to what's behind them. And a few others like myself will use the clicker to click through each picture, so you can put the detail in. Um, as and when you it comes out, you know comes out of your mouth, so to speak. Um, but it's, it's tried and tested with the way I do it. Actually, I, I have faith in myself, but I don't know if I teach anyone to do it that way. <laughs> now you're, you know, a BBC weather presenter of high esteem. Is like the headline show of your job, saying the cup final at Wembley, or you know, playing Madison Square Gardens. Is that doing the BBC Country File? Uh, forecast on a Sunday? Well, I guess for my colleagues down south, but we had our own country fell type forecast up here in Scotland. Um, we had Landward, which is a kind of similar type of programme. So we used to do a forecast into that. Um, the thing about the country fell forecast is it's three minutes long and three minutes is a long time to film. So <laughs> they, they've got like a whole week and they always dress down, don't they? I like the fact they went. Yeah, do you like that stuff. dress down oh, Friday? Lo- oh, oh, I love it. It's great. <laughs> right. Anyway, you've got a brand new book out as well. It's called What's yes. the Weather? It's all about how climate change uh, is kind of affecting what's happening day to day for us now. How much have you noticed as a weather presenter what's going on? How the, the, the climate change is, is massively changing what's up in our skies? Well, I think... Uh, over the, I was thinking back to 10 years ago because exactly 10 years ago today we started to have a massive snow event uh, and I don't know if you remember that, that, certainly in Scotland, I can't remember it was south of the border as well, but we had basically snow from now right through until, well, it was February, but before it lifted snow and severe frosts. So it was a real Arctic winter that we had. Now we've not really seen as many snowy events um, as we saw over those two years, actually about 10 years ago. I've noticed a change to wetter weather, I think is definitely because low pressure, we've got more clouds, we've got more rain, um, the air's getting warmer, the sea's slight, this is all very marginal warmer. When there's warmer air, warmer air holds more moisture, which means more rain, which means more flooding events. And that's what I've noticed. There's more events to do with flooding and rain. Ah, it's the warmer air. That's the secret. That's yeah. amazing. Uh, well, I'm pleased to have kind of figured that out, Judith. Thank you so much for joining us. The brand new book is called What's the Weather? Uh, it's by Judith Ralston. Uh, and yeah, it, it's out in January. So you can get it a copy. Thank you so much for joining us, Judith. It's a pleasure. Thank you. It's time for this week's Dangerous Dan. Now, it's been a big new year for me. I've got a new cat. 
Uh, she's black and white. She's the cutest thing alive. I'm sorry if you've got a pet. Mine's absolutely cuter than yours. Her name is Luna. She says hello. And she's got me thinking about some big, brutal cats. So today's Dangerous Dan is all about one of the meanest of them all. The jaguar is an animal that you've probably heard of, but they're a little bit unknown, right? Most people are focused on the lion or the tiger. Now, the jaguar is one of the largest big cats in the world. You mostly find them near the Amazon River you know, in South America. Normally, they've got orange, tan-coloured furs with black spots that are called rosettes. Now, they're quick, but they're quite chunky creatures, which is brilliant for them because it gives them the heft and the strength to take down any form of prey. They'll eat almost anything as well with incredible force. They're fantastic swimmers too, so you can't even hide in the water. Now the name Jaguar, it comes from the native word in South America, Yaguar, and that means he who kills with one leap gives a good clue to what they're brilliant at. If that doesn't show how deadly they are, then what will? Now, here's the real killer. Their bite is more powerful than any other big cat. Their jaws can take down prey up to four times their own weight. Their teeth can bite through the skin of crocodiles, even the shells of turtles. And they're fantastic at leaping and super quick swimmers as well. They are nasty. They are brutal. The jaguar is absolutely brilliant. So let's have a look at what's happening inside your body right now. This is Professor Hallux. Hallux's Physiology Fix-Up. My new phone is brilliant. So many apps. A million books to read, maths calculators, maps, encyclopedias on every topic, translators. Hey, Nanobot, I think it would make a perfectly serviceable human brain. Really? Absolutely. Look at all it can do. Check this out. How cool would it be if your brain could do what this app does? It makes you talk like a hamster. I'm a hamster. Eek, eek. Ew. That's just weird. Anyway, are you absolutely sure it could do all the jobs the brains do? There's only one way to find out. That's to learn more about the physiology of the brain. Organs and systems in our bodies have a number of jobs to do, and they're able to do all these jobs because of the way they are constructed and the way they work with other parts of the body. Loading physiology file. The human brain. Job one, processing information. Well, my mobile phone can do that no trouble. I can have a dozen apps open at once, and it still keeps up. Physiology fail. But it's nowhere near as fast as the human brain. Brains are up to 30 times faster than the fastest supercomputer. They process 400 billion bits of information in a single second. Bother! Brains job to perception. Receiving information from the world around you. Things like sights, sounds, sensations, smells, tastes. Physiology fail. Well, the camera on your phone might be able to see and the microphone might be able to hear, but I don't think you can get an app that smells. Not yet, but soon. Just you wait and see. Brains, job three. Motor control. Maintaining and moving the body. Physiology fail. Now hang on. Mobile phones can be used to turn on lights and the central heating at home. Even start washing machines. That's maintaining and moving things. But they can't move human bodies. Yet, bionic computer-operated limbs and organs are being developed. But we're not there yet. Brains. Job for waking up and sending back to sleep. Oh, come on. That's not fair. My phone has an alarm, doesn't it? And I can listen to some lovely music to send myself to sleep. That's hardly the same thing. Admit it. This was your worst idea ever. A mobile phone brain, indeed. Physiology fail. The test isn't over yet. There's more jobs. Gosh, brains are busy, aren't they? Brains. Job five, memory and learning. Look, my phone has nearly 300 gigabytes of memory. Ah, beat that brain box. Physiology fail. Although we can't measure things in exactly the same way, a brain is thought to have a petabyte of memory. That's a million gigabytes. Just one test left. Brains, job six, motivation. Making sure the body does all the things it needs to stay alive, like finding food, seeking shelter and avoiding danger. 
Physiology fail. Well, I could set reminders for all that. 7 a.m. Eat breakfast. <laughs> but what if your body needs changes by the second? The brain is constantly monitoring your health and needs, providing stimulation or rewards and guiding you accordingly. It's also why you feel pain. It might not be nice, but it's the way that your body helps you stay out of danger. Ha! Huh, well, that's all well and good. But can your brain make you talk like a hamster? Well, clearly not. But I don't see how that's going to keep you alive. Well, if you needed to get on the right side of a nasty gang of hamsters, it could be just a ticket. But hamsters don't even... Ugh, oh, never mind. Alex's Physiology Fix-Up, with support from the Physiological Society. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash Halux. Let's get this week's science in the news. Climate experts think this year could be the turning point for the environment. An important climate conference is happening later on in the year where world leaders will discuss how to save the planet. Countries are already promising to cut their carbon emissions and renewable energy is the cheapest that it's ever been. A brilliant start to the new year. Uh, Also, the core of a giant NASA rocket that will take humans to the moon has undergone a crucial test. The space locket system... The Space Launch System rocket was loaded with liquid propellant, which was controlled by scientists, then they drained it. Now, the propellant is the fuel which powers it, so knowing that it works is clearly a big deal to get people to the moon. And finally, the RSPB Bird Charity has criticised the UK government's decision to build an offshore wind farm in the North Sea off the coast of Yorkshire. They say that it will disturb feeding areas, and some of the birds will need to dodge turbines just to get some food. And that is it for the Fun Kids Science Weekly this week. Uh, If you've got a science question that you want answered, maybe it's something simple that you can't believe we haven't spoken about, like today's, about how lightning is made. Let me know what it is uh, over on Apple Podcasts, if that's how you listen. If you listen in another way, you can always send a message to my page over at funkidslive.com. While you're there, it's one of the best places that you can hear loads of podcasts that we make across so many different topics science history uh, engineering loads they're on the fun kids website Uh, they're on apple podcasts they're wherever you get your shows and you can also listen on the free fun kids app and fun kids were a children's radio station from the uk Uh, you can listen to us all around the country on your dab digital radio on that free fun kids app and at funkidslive.com 